for a big story this morning as Donald Trump awaits a likely indictment for his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. The former president was hit with three new charges yesterday in a separate case. In the Southern District of Florida, federal prosecutors added two new counts of obstruction and one of willfully retaining national defense information in the case centered around his mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Those new charges laid out in a superseding indictment, which alleges Trump directed two employees at his Palm Beach estate to destroy security camera footage shortly after the Justice Department issued a subpoena to obtain the same video in June of last year. One of the employees, Trump's valet, Walt Nauta, was previously charged along with Trump. Now, someone else has been added. Mar-a-Lago property manager, Carlos D. Oliveira, was charged in yesterday's follow-up indictment. It describes a moment when the two men walked with a flashlight through a dark tunnel at Mar-a-Lago to scope out a room where boxes of classified documents were being watched by security cameras. A few days later, D. Oliveira allegedly told another employee, quote, the boss wanted security footage from that room deleted. As for the other charge, that one involves a meeting from last August at Trump's property in Bedminster, New Jersey. There, the former president allegedly showed off a classified document about possible attack plans for Iran to people who were doing interviews for his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows' upcoming memoir. That conversation, you'll remember, was captured on an audio tape that was leaked last month. Well, with Milley, uh, let me see that. I'll show you an example. He said that I wanted to attack Iran. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. Look, this was him. They presented me this. This is off the record, but they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. Wow. We looked at some. This was him. This wasn't done by me. This was him. Mm. All sorts of stuff. It's pages long. Look. Mm. Wait a minute. Let's see here. Mm. Yeah. I just found, isn't that amazing? This totally wins my case, you know. Mm -hmm. Except it is like highly confidential. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, isn't that incredible? Though? Yeah. I was just saying, because we were talking about it. <laughs> and he, you know, he said, he wanted to attack Iran and what? And he said, you did. It's pretty, oh, pretty this was done by the military, given to me. Uh, I Wait. think we can probably, right? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to Declassify. figure out a, a yeah. See, as president, I could have declassified. Yeah. But now I can't, you know, but this is Yeah, now, now we have a problem. It's so that's audio of that meeting at Bedminster in New Jersey. In total now, with the new superseding indictment, Trump is now charged with 40 counts in the classified documents case. He and Nada have pleaded not guilty to their previous charges. A lawyer for D. Oliveira, the property manager, declined to comment. A trial date is tentatively set for May 20th, 2024. So Chuck Rosenberg, we all were waiting yesterday perhaps to hear for a new indictment in an entirely separate case involving Involving the 2020 election and the efforts to overturn it. This goes back now to the Mar-a-Lago documents case. So for our viewers, what is a superseding indictment, number one, and what do you read into the content of it? Sure. Number one, a superseding indictment is simply additional charges on an existing indictment. The first indictment of Mr. Trump and Mr. Nada and Mar-a-Lago for mishandling classified documents and obstructing the investigation was unsealed about a month ago or so, uh, Willie. They have now added charges to it. They've added another defendant, um, Mr. De Oliveira. That supersedes the first indictment. It replaces it. Uh, it has additional charges, and we call it a superseding indictment. What do I make of it? Well, you know, it's sort of sad in a way. When I was a federal prosecutor, there were always lower level individuals and I can tell you, quite frankly, I didn't get any joy out of prosecuting them. My goal was always to enlist their cooperation, to have them tell the truth. You know, each of them come to a fork in the road where they can either tell the truth or they can lie. And if they lie, if they obstruct justice, if they attempt, in this case, to delete security footage that has been subpoenaed by the Department of Justice, agents and prosecutors really don't have a choice other than to walk away. And they're not inclined to do that. 
And that's how people like Mr. Nada, a low-level valet, and Mr. De Oliveira, a low-level property manager, end up in a federal criminal indictment with Mr. Trump, the former president of the United States. Here's what else I make of it. They made really bad choices when they decided to lie to the FBI and obstruct justice. It may not be too late for a good attorney to help each of them salvage it. They can still tell the truth, and they can still minimize any damage to themselves. Whether or not that happens, Willie, we'll see. So, Ken Delaney, as you look through this new superseding indictment, a new character is introduced, as Chuck said. This is Mr. D. Oliveira. He's 56 years old, the head of maintenance and Mar-a-Lago, a property manager, effectively there, who was pulled into all of this by Donald Trump just last summer, June 22nd, 2022, when the DOJ emailed Trump's attorneys a draft subpoena. Donald Trump says, OK, now I know the FBI, DOJ is coming for whatever I have here and perhaps for security footage setting in motion this process by which ultimately D. Oliveira tells the head of IT at Mar-a-Lago, the boss, in his words, wants this stuff deleted. Um, you've looked through this indictment. What else do you see in there? Willie, let's just take a pause on what you just said. It's just extraordinary. These allegations rival anything that Richard Nixon was accused of. These yeah. are two additional counts of obstruction of justice. And these this indictment reads like a mafia case. Here you have, and again, these are allegations, and, and the burden of proof here is high, and they don't have direct witnesses implicating Trump. But this is a scheme to destroy evidence three days after a grand jury subpoena lands on Mr. Trump. It's, it, it's mind-boggling. And as Chuck said, it involves very low-level employees whose lives uh, are about to be ruined unless they cut a deal with prosecutors. And, and as for Mr. Nada, there's no sign that he's going to do that. His lawyers are paid for by Mr. Trump. He's, he's completely loyal. He's following Mr. Trump around. Um, so, and the other thing I think about these obstruction elements is that, you know, a lot of regular Americans out out there who don't follow this very closely, when they hear about the classified documents case, they have a hard time distinguishing what Trump did from what Joe Biden and Mike Pence did, even though we all know that it's vastly different, right? All three men had classified documents in their possession. Uh, well, so, but nobody has trouble, I think, uh, differentiating these incredible obstruction of justice charges. Everybody understands what it means to destroy evidence, particularly surveillance video evidence. Now, I have to point out that there's no allegation in this new superseding indictment that they actually attempted to destroy the tapes. Remember, we read in the New York Times about an episode where there was a flood and, and there was some uh, concern that that was an attempt to destroy the footage. That's not in here. There's no allegation either. There, there's nobody that can directly put Mr. Trump in a room and testify, I heard him say, destroy the tapes. That's It's all hearsay. It's employee number four saying, I talked to Carlos de Oliveira, and that's what he said. So obviously what they would really like, as Chuck said, is for Mr. de Oliveira to come and testify and tell the truth about his conversations with Mr. Trump. But if you read this indictment, the, the, the obstruction is extraordinary. And then secondly, of course, this mysterious uh, document, which we believe was a military plan, well, we believe the indictment now says it was a military plan uh, about options for attacking Iran. Donald Trump said it didn't exist, remember, after the original indictment. Now we know the government has it, has had it since Trump turned over the first batch of documents to the National Archive in January 2022. And it's the subject of the tape you just played, and it's a devastating piece of evidence. So this superseding indictment, it seems to me, really strengthens this already very strong case. And, you know, we were all waiting around yesterday thinking that the January 6th indictment was coming. So we're, we're only at the beginning, really the third inning, I think, of the, of the federal legal troubles for former President Donald Trump. Will and some big news to tell you about as you wake up. Donald Trump is waiting, as you know, for a likely indictment for his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. But now the former president has been hit with three new charges. It happened yesterday in a separate case, the Mar-a-Lago case. 
In the Southern District of Florida, federal prosecutors added two new counts of obstruction and one of willfully retaining national defense information in the case centered around his handling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Those new charges were laid out in this superseding indictment, which alleges Trump directed two employees at his Palm Beach estate to destroy security camera footage shortly after the Justice Department issued a subpoena to obtain the same video in June of last year. One of those employees, Trump's valet, Walt Nauta, previously was charged along with Trump. The other now, a new character introduced into the story, is Mar-a-Lago property manager, Carlos D. Oliveira. He was charged in yesterday's follow-up indictment. That indictment describes a moment when the two men, Nada and D. Oliveira, walked with a flashlight through a dark tunnel at Mar-a-Lago to scope out a room where boxes of classified documents were being watched by security cameras. A few days later, D. Oliveira allegedly told another employee that, quote, the boss wanted security footage from that room deleted. As for the other charge, that one involves a meeting from last August at Trump's property in Bedminster, New Jersey. There, the former president allegedly showed off a classified document about military options for attacking Iran to people who were doing interviews for his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, upcoming memoir. That conversation was captured in this audio tape leaked last month. Well, with Milley, uh, let me see that. I'll show you an example. He said that I wanted to attack Iran. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. Look. This was him. They presented me this. This is off the record, but they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. Wow. We looked at some. This was him. This wasn't done by me. This was him. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. It's pages long. Look. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's see here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just found, isn't that amazing? This totally wins my case, you know. Mm -hmm. Except it is like highly confidential. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, isn't that incredible? Though? Yeah. I was just saying, because we were talking about it. <laughs> and he, he said, he wanted to attack Iran and what? He's in the papers. This was done by the military, given to me. Uh, I think we can probably. Right? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to try to de-classify. Figure out a, a yeah. See, as president, I could have de-classified. Yeah. No, I can't. You know, but this is. Yeah, now we have a problem. It's in total, Trump is now charged with 40 counts in the classified documents case. He and Nada have pleaded not guilty to their previous charges. A lawyer for D. Oliveira, the property manager, declined to comment. A trial tentatively set for May 20th, 2024. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Andrew Weissman, New York Times opinion columnist David French, and the host of the podcast On Brand with Donny Deutsch. Donny Deutsch. Jonathan Lemire, Michael Steele, Jen Palmieri, all still with us as well. So, Andrew Weissman, let's begin with you. Just to be clear for our viewers, this is not the indictment that we all have been waiting for this week involving the separate federal case around the 2020 election and around January 6th. This takes us back to the Mar-a-Lago case. So as you read through this superseding indictment and, as I said, the introduction of a new character, Mr. D. Oliveira, the property manager, what do you see here? Well, I thought the case was very strong before this, but it, it is incredible that it has now gotten much stronger. With respect to the obstruction charges, the government's now going to be able to say, see this really damning surveillance evidence? This is the evidence that the defendants did not want you to see. There was a plan to get rid of it, and you know why. Uh, so it is, it is really good evidence, and it helps bolster the underlying part of the case, and of course, it's an additional set of crimes. And then with respect to the Bedminster tape, if you recall, this was a really explosive tape. And what we heard from the former president was, you know, he was just blustering, this that he didn't really have a document. He was just shuffling papers. This is now not just described 
in the indictment. It is charged. It is now part of the criminal charge in this case. And it's very clear from the allegations that the government knows exactly which document this is and when it was returned to the National Archives. So there is no question, at least in the government's minds, that they actually have the document, that it is not true, according to these allegations, that this is just bluster and that he was just showing some sort of newspaper or, or some rustling of some unknown paper. Uh, this is now the tape recording that you just played is now direct evidence of a charged crime. It's hard to see something stronger than that. Every prosecutor wants to have their defendant on tape confessing to a crime, and that's exactly what the government has now in its hands. That's a good point. After that tape was leaked, Donald Trump had said, no, I was just it was newspapers or I had plans for a new golf course. Meanwhile, he was talking about how they were classified. And it's clear from this this new indictment that the government knows what that document is. You had raised the possibility to us a few weeks ago, Andrew, of a separate case coming out of New Jersey because this conversation and these documents allegedly were flashed in Bedminster, which is in the state of New Jersey. But now it looks like this has been folded into the Florida case. Is that what happened here? Yeah, absolutely. It seems pretty clear there was a there was a venue issue that seemed to hang up the government because this is a tape recording of something that happened in Bedminster. But if you look at the uh, new charges that were unveiled yesterday, Clearly, the government has been able to see that this document made its way uh, not just to Bedminster, but back to Mar-a-Lago. So that gives them venue. Um, the Constitution requires that you bring charges where the crime occurred. And here they're alleging that that document was at some point retained by the president, the former president, at Mar-a-Lago. So with that piece, they were able to bring this as part of the existing case. And the tape recording that you played is now direct evidence. There's no question mm -hmm. that Judge Cannon has to let the tape recording into evidence now in this case. The military been segregated since our founding. Yet hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people of color, men and women still courageously served with love of country that often didn't love them back. They served in our Revolutionary War, declaring independence from a king only to be enslaved by a master. They protected the Union in the Civil War only to face disunion under Jim Crow. They sacrificed during two world wars, fighting against autocracy only to be denied the freedom of their own democracy. When these veterans came home, they were still denied equal opportunity in housing, education, jobs, even marriage, families held in incarceration camps. Many of them denied the benefits of the GI Bill because the states, the states put up barriers to be able to collect that GI benefit. That's what happened 75 years ago when an American president chose to do right. And that's what we commemorate tonight, a forward march in our own lives, in the life of the nation, toward the North Star, the idea of America. It beats in the heart of all of our people. President Biden speaking yesterday at the Truman Civil Rights Symposium, honoring the 75th anniversary of President Truman's order to desegregate the military. Joining us now, Pulitzer Prize winning author and presidential historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. Doris, it's so great to have you with us as we've been talking this week about indictments, a new one yesterday, the potential of another indictment of a former president of the United States and all that that means for the country. It is good to stop and point to moments like the one we saw yesterday, the anniversary of the desegregation of the military, the announcement by the president and by the White House of monuments, a couple of them for Emmett Till and his mother as well. These are moments that are worth our attention. They are worth marking and obviously huge moments in the history of our country. Oh, you're so right, Willie. You know, I mean, I think about the fact, what if, if the former president had accepted the peaceful transition of power and the public space had now been open for the last two and a half years for discussions just like this, rather than continually having to worry about January 6th indictments, congressional hearings. But here we are. It was a good week in many ways for history. I mean, it started off badly with the Florida 
standards being set that you're supposed to talk in these classrooms about the good things that happened to slaves. But then it went on with the monument to Emmett Till, and not just to the commemoration of the poor little boy who was killed, but the courageous decision of his mother, who was willing to let his face be shown. And it fired the conscience of the country. And it fired 100 days later. There was Rosa Parks sitting in the bus, told to go to the back of the bus. And she thought of Emmett Till. And she said, no, I'm going to stay here. And that brings out the boycott, the bus boycott. That brings out Martin Luther King. He comes forward. That has the sit-ins, the freedom, ripples of hope that change things. And just to watch President Biden yesterday at the 75th anniversary, Truman's thing was truly hard for him to do. He came from a Confederate family. His mother hated Lincoln so much that she said when she went to the White House, she would not sleep in his bedroom. If she had to, she'd sleep on the floor rather than on his bed. And yet he defied that background and he gave that executive order. He said that what happened to him, and it talks about what Biden was just talking about, he watched the returning veterans come home after World War II, and they were forced into second-rate citizenship again in the South. And there was one veteran in particular who was blinded by a police officer, and then the police officer got off, of course, in the jury trial. And it made him realize more than just the statistics did what happened to that one person. That's what David McCullough said. Sometimes that can be more powerful than statistics. And he went for that executive order, even though it meant that he was risking his election in 1948, because the Dixiecrats would move away from the Democratic Party before. It. But he won. He won because he went out on a train and he fought for civil rights and he fought for Medicare. And it was said that his own party was called him where we're mild about Harry. Well, after that train ride, they were wild about Harry, and he won that surprise election. So it shows that fighting for the rights of things is what we should do. And it may be that this is Truman is a good model, I think, for President Biden right now. I mean, it's good that he was able to bring all this bipartisan legislation that he can run on, but now he's got to fight on what's still happening in so many of these states, books that are being banned, libraries that are being closed, abortions that are being increased in terms of the bans on them. There's a lot to fight about. And I think that fighting spirit of good old Truman would be a good thing for Biden to take up. So, Doris, we saw a little bit of that fighting spirit from President Biden last night. And polls suggest that voters are mild about Joe, but he, the record is there. And he used the moment to speak about the armed services to call out Senator Tuberville of Alabama and his blockade of these military positions. They're not being filled because of what he's doing. Uh, and President Biden, in his harshest language yet, used to talk about how the Republicans used to be the party of defense. They used to be the party of national security. And they're not doing that anymore. They're letting us down. Talk to us about, about that evolution. Did you ever imagine that a Republican party that once so linked itself to the Pentagon would now do this? Yeah, it's still it's still boggling to see that, and and some parts of the Republican Party not supporting the war in Ukraine, something that's so important for um, world order, something about NATO. Um, but I think that's where you do have to make that fight. Biden was pretty energetic last night, just watching him. He was walking around and and he was talking, and he felt that fight in his feeling. And also, just think about it: the military, after that 75 year anniversary, is our most diverse and our most respected institution in all of the country. And here we have programs in many states, one after another, to undo diversity and inclusion. Those are the kind of things that President Biden should be fighting against. That's what we all should be fighting against. You know, sometimes I think of myself, if I were a young woman right now, so much is happening to history. It's being taken away in our schools. It's being whitewashed. It's being reduced. It's being forced to have certain kinds of discussions. You can't have any that make people anxious. So you may not even be able to talk about Jim Crow. I mean, historians have to be out there. Maybe we have to be sitting in. Maybe we have to be doing something for our profession, because without history, and that's what was shown yesterday, history gave President Biden a platform to talk about the importance of diversity, the importance of inclusion, the importance of creating an institution like the military, which has become, as I say, one of the most respected in the country because of its inclusion. And I think that spirit would do him very well to continue on that path. He's already got the benefits of the, of the kind of person he is that wanted to bring people together. All those things have happened. Now you can shift and say, but there's still much more we have to do, and we have to fight going backward. We're going forward. We cannot go backward. Doris, I, I really appreciate that point, and I'd like to frame it out a little bit more, um, because we are a nation now with fewer and fewer Trumans, Eisenhowers, Reagans, uh, Daddy Bush, right? And even Joe Biden in, in the terms that he laid out yesterday. So how does the nation 
uh, respond in this moment to a, to the emerging narratives, not just in Florida, but around the country, that black men and women in this country benefited from slavery. Mm -hmm. Somehow our skills that we apply today were learned, um, and it was a good thing that we were able to learn those skills from slavery. H how, how does the nation, the, its people, respond in this moment? I mean, the nation has to understand that to talk about slavery as a job training program for black Americans is, is just a violation of everything we know about history. I mean, we have to be able to tell people when things were terrible, because good things come out of the bad things. You know, sometimes I think at the end of a day, what if we could just erase our memories of the bad things that happened to us that day? Mm -hmm. Maybe we could just have no resentments. We could be better people. And I think, no, just the opposite. The only way you grow as a person is by learning from your mistakes, learning from the bad things that happened. And that's what our history has done. We've learned, look, think Think of how far we came when the Birmingham Bull Connor sent those dogs against the children, and that produced Jack Kennedy introducing the Civil Rights Bill. Selma and what happened in the brutal attack produces the Voting Rights Act. Um, all the good things that have happened to us come from confronting the bad things and moving forward. That's the progress. It takes time, and sometimes it's just one step at a time and one baton. But if we try to whitewash our history and say that, oh, these things make people anxious, we can't even talk about them. In Tennessee, you're not even supposed to talk about struggles. Racism is not supposed to to be used. You, and some people are afraid they can't even teach about the civil rights struggle. We have to fight that as historians, as a people. And we know that our history makes us strong rather than weak. But if we allow ourselves not to even deal with the truth of the history, then we have no chance of going forward. We are going backward if we do that. But I don't think we're going to do that. People see that this is wrong, and people are fighting it. I mean, librarians just being undone now in, in Houston. They're going to be put, instead of having librarians in the public system, libraries closed, they're going to be detention centers. How can this be? People need books in their schools. These things are really important to fight against, and we as a people have to do it. We've gotten some painful reminders, but important ones, that we have to fight for our democracy. It's not something to be taken for granted. Doris Kearns Goodwin, always bringing us her wisdom. It's so great to see you. Thanks for being here today. Some Republican lawmakers this morning are telling NBC News they have concerns about Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and his health, and that they personally have witnessed changes in the 81-year-old after he fell and sustained a concussion in March. Their comments come following Wednesday's incident when the Kentucky Republican froze for 19 seconds during a press conference before being escorted away from the cameras. None of the Republicans are calling on McConnell to step down yet, and Senators next in line for the top jobs say they are not making succession plans at this time. But the murmurings underscore how the party is struggling to deal with the sensitive health issues of the longest serving Senate party leader in American history. NBC News also spoke with other Republican lawmakers who stand behind McConnell and say they have complete confidence in his ability to lead their conference. He said he's fine. I take him at face value. You heard him respond to questions yesterday. He was very crisp in his uh, in his answers. All I know is he's tough. He's been here a long time. He has a tremendous amount of support. Um, everyone knows that uh, w with one hand tied behind his back, he's still uh, a superior leader to uh, uh, so many people here that uh, I think people still have a lot of confidence in him. I think it's just maybe fatigue. There's been a lot going on. I mean, we're doing all kind of bills. My head was spinning, too, but trying to keep up with all the things that we try to get done in the next two or three months. McConnell has served in the United States Senate since 1985. He's not up for re-election until the 2026 midterm elections. And Jonathan Lemire, you've got some new reporting on how the White House is watching all of this. Obviously, President Biden, an old friend of Senator McConnell's from the Senate no, days. No question. The two men spoke uh, this week after McConnell's incident there, had a warm conversation, uh, I am told. But the White House is watching this warily. McConnell, for so long, has been such a villain for Democrats. But now for this White House, he's become an important partner and a, and a bulwark, uh, if you will, holding back some of the more radical right-wing forces of lawmaker, Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill, also willing to keep McCarthy in check and, more importantly, willing to keep Donald Trump in check. And the White House worried about what could
would come next. Uh, McConnell not expected to run for re-election. Uh, so there are, the White House is already preparing for what that could look like, a post-McConnell GOP, Michael Steele. But if McConnell's health forces him to step away before then, yeah. and his team is saying that's not going to be the case, right. uh, obviously that new future could come, could come even sooner. But talk to us about the dynamic there in the Senate. I think you and I both know that there are succession oh, there plans, are succession being, plans. Dis being discussed. Oh, absolutely. Well, talk to us about what that could look like. Well, I, I think there, you know, there, there would be a battle for the leadership, particularly if the Senate becomes more in play for the 20, in the 2024 cycle, where it looks like Republicans can can take the majority again. Um, and I think that would be one way in which McConnell could very easily transition out. Either way, actually, um, so that battle for the num for who would then succeed him in the leadership is going to be. Um, I think it's going to be a lot more tense than people think it is. I mean, John Thune. Mm -hmm. Would be my personal favorite, to be honest. Uh, I've known him a long time, and I think he's um, an incredible leader who has that ability to work with the the uh, president across the aisle, you know, and all of that. Should should Biden uh, return to office? Um, but there's always going to be that that sort of MAGA s kind of backflow, uh, which is sort of bubbled up in the Senate with the Tubervilles and others um, kind of making noise. So that's going to be an interesting storyline. What I find more interesting right now, particularly in the clips that were played, take out McConnell's name and stick in Biden. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and 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 so we can we can dispense with all the all ageism stuff coming from Republicans about Joe Biden, because the reality of it is we are we are a country that's being led by octogenarians, older individuals um, and both parties, you know, are on the pike on this one. So dial it back. Be concerned about McConnell's health, as I'm sure people are concerned about Biden and they're concerned about Dianne Feinstein and others. Um, those narratives will play themselves out. But this whole idea that my guy who had this episode in front of national cameras is somehow better than your guy who tripped over a sandbag. It's just, you know, we need to we just need to pull all that crazy aside and, and move beyond that at this point, because their health obviously is important. But you can't you can't drive the politics necessarily that way. And if it's if it's that bad for McConnell or Biden or anyone else, then step out of it. Jamie Lee Curtis doing a fight scene in last year's Best Picture, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, a role that earned Curtis the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Her new film, Haunted Mansion, inspired by the Disney ride of the same name, premieres today in theaters. Before the SAG after strike began, Joe sat down with Curtis for a wide-ranging conversation. I'm just going to say a couple of words. The Bear. Christmas dinner and Donna. Donna. I almost stroked out. <laughs> that episode almost so did me in. Okay, but you're a Peaky Blinders fan. Exactly. And the combination of music and visuals and great storytelling mm -hmm. and great acting in combo. Right. Peaky Blinders, mm -hmm. even though it's very different, there's a similarity to right. it. There's a use of current music, there's a visual style and a, a real commitment in the performances. And so, yes, I'm very excited that Chris Storer yeah. asked me to play Donna Brazato. How did you know a year ago? I knew a year ago. That when you yep. were watching the first yep. season, you are yep. like, I'm going to be Well, the no, what happened was in the first season, in the first episode, Sugar right. brings Carmi the jacket. Mm -hmm. And she says, we don't know anything about them. We don't know Carmen. their relationship. We don't know anything. And she All says, time, did you call mom? And he said, no. And she said, I think you should call her. That's all they say. Right. And he says, OK, I will. And for some reason, I went, oh, they have a mother. Oh, I'm going to play her. How did you know that? I just, in the same way I knew I was going to marry Christopher Guest when I saw his picture in a magazine. Is that it? That, I, that, that, and th that's how I married Christopher took. Guest. I saw a picture in a magazine. It must have been a good picture. It's just him and a couple guys in shirts yeah. with their arms around each other. Right. Um, I 
do have a sense when I have that sense. I, I'm pretty clear about it. Wow. And um, I, by the way, I just had that sense. I went, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I'll play her. And then I, I, I think I told my agents, and uh, I'm sure they called them and said, hey, by mm -hmm. the way, Jamie thinks the show is amazing, as does everybody. Wow. And then in January of this year, I got a call from my agent who said that Chris had asked if I would play Donna. What a dream role. It was extraordinary for me. Mm -hmm. uh, he sent me the script. I never met him until I walked on set. We texted like teenagers. <laughs> I am like, uh, I text like a teenager. Yeah. And our communication was just texting. You and Mika would get along very well. Well, give me her number. I, I will. will inundate you her. Will, oh, no. No, she will wear you down. Okay, watch this. Hold on. Okay. I, is, is voice text. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write her a message now, which okay. I'm going to text her after we finish, and you're going to give me her number. Okay. Hi, Mika. Period. It's Jamie Lee Curtis. Period. I'm sitting here with your very attractive husband. Period. No, I'm not hitting on him. Period. He's dressed a bit like a preppy, but it works for him. Period. That's what I will send to your wife when we finish, when you give me her you text have number. No idea what... I text, talk, oh. I'm that person. No, and my family is. can't tell if I'm she... talking to them oh. or into my phone. No, 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 that's, that's, that's her. Okay, well. So you two are going to have a good I'm looking forward to time. it. All right, so back to the bear. Your scenes, that Christmas dinner. I heard you talking about this. We, we all know a character like this in our life. Yeah. So I knew because it was written who she was. I've seen the show. Mm -hmm. I certainly know the backstory. I know the history of the family. And the thing that was most interesting for me is the idea of playing somebody who desperately wants help but then refuses it. And that contradiction that you're playing both sides mm -hmm. of that coin all the time. Right. Help me, don't help me. Help me, don't help me. Help me, don't help me. Right. Right. Stop. Okay, it's okay. I just worked all day for them. I worked all day. I know. I know. Everybody, everybody really appreciates it too. It's just fucking it all hurt. Why, well, um. What's hard? What's hard, Mom? What is it? I make things beautiful for them. And no one makes things beautiful for me. Even in the finale, yeah. she understands. You see growth. She understands at the end. I think she's sober in the finale. She knows she needs help, but she doesn't ask for it. But here we are in the finale. But she does, but see, she does ask for it and then refuses it. And then refuses the help. That's the... That combination of when alcohol and expectation come mm -hmm. together, which is what Christmas dinners are all about. Right. I think her attempt at sobriety is the first time she can understand that she, there's a cause and effect and she's both. Mm -hmm. And it's best for her to stay back. It's amazing, y your own history with, with fighting um, addiction. Oh, yeah. And getting through it. Yeah, yeah. We all have friends also that have been struggling with addiction. Yeah, sure. Oh. But, but I heard you say something pretty remarkable. It went from generation to generation, just like in The Bear. Mm -hmm. But you said, it stops here. It stops with me. I think that the buck stops here idea mm -hmm. is an important one for generational um, addiction, any kind of generational trauma. My worst day was almost invisible to anyone else. There was, in my, I'm lucky, I didn't make terrible decisions high or uh, under the influence that then for the rest of my life I regret. There are women in prison whose lives have been shattered by drugs and alcohol not because they were violent felons, not because they were horrible people, but because they were addicts. And I am incredibly lucky that that wasn't my, my path. I was, an opiate, oh. I was an opiate addict. Right. 
and I liked a good opiate buzz. Mm -hmm. And if fentanyl was available as easily available as it is today on the street, I'd be dead. Sobriety simply just made it all crystal and clear um, because I'm so hyperly aware of what the alternative is. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen it in my own family. My brother at 21 is dead from a heroin overdose. Mm -hmm. Once he was clean and sober and he went out and used one time yeah. and uh, uh, died from an overdose. And he is one of millions and millions of people whose lives have, have been extinguished because of addiction. So uh, my gratitude is 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 enormous because I also have this incredible life. Every day, I'm grateful. Right. Grateful to get up. And we get to grow old. The, I work with Children's Hospital Los Angeles with a charity. Can I ask you how you, how you, how you get involved there? Because sure, that obviously that means a lot to you and you've raised a ton of money. And you know what I love? 100% of this 100%. is going straight to them. Immediately, that lets down everybody's guard. And it's like, oh, wait. She's actually doing this for the right reason. I make money doing a lot of things. I've talked about it a little bit. I've made a living through violence. My early career, my main career was uh, an art form that people love. The people who love it are beautiful people. Mm -hmm. They're not violent people. They happen to love violent movies horror movies. They love them. My daughter, absolutely. Daughter? Well, she's 20 now, but she's, she's, and loved, she loved them. She loved them. And, and would sit, would watch everything together. The horror movie come on and go, I'll be in the kitchen, baby. But I hate Isn't them. That funny? Yeah, <laughs> I do too. But yeah. I'm grateful because yeah. they gave me an entire career, right. turning it onto something that truly means something to me, which is helping children heal from critical injuries or illnesses is a very important thing. Here's the briefest story. I was making a movie once in Pontiac, Illinois. Uh, it was a, not a good movie. It's called Grandview USA. There was a charity being put on by the town for a 13-year-old girl named Lori Tall who had had the first successful heart transplant and the town of Pontiac put on a benefit to help her pay her bills because the insurance company wouldn't pay for it. Mm. And the movie company joined the town putting on this benefit, and she and I became friends. Over the years, we stayed friends. She had a second heart. She rejected her first one, had a second heart transplant, died at 19. Mm. I started working with Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I put video machines in the rooms there in her name so that the kids could enjoy watching movies while they were in treatment because we've learned that children need less pain management they need they heal quicker when they are entertained when there's something for them to do other than just sit in bed and then i came back to la and uh it felt weird to me i was flying to pittsburgh to do work on the children's hospital but i live in los angeles and we have the greatest children's hospital in los angeles and i call i cold called them one day wow and said hi it's jamie lee curtis how can I help you? And they were just raising money for the bond initiatives. We did two California bond acts for the uh, California Children's Hospital Bond Act. It was all the children's hospitals, not just Los Angeles. And I became the spokesperson. We get to age. We get to. I get to look like this. There are a lot of people that aren't going to make it to my age. And so being able to focus on, on healing and helping uh, critically ill and injured children is a very important thing to do. As That's far as amazing. I'm what an amazing story about how it all began. That's how I first, and by the way, mm -hmm. there was a second girl at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I met this young cancer patient, Katie Westbrook, and she was in a, we were in a, um, you know, like a press conference. She was wearing a pink a wig sitting next to me. We had just met. It was like, right. hi, I'm Jamie. Hi, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. Katie. We sat down. The people were like, why are you here, Jamie? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, thing, I'm saying support the hospital and patients like my friend Katie here. And Katie, why are you here today? And she ripped off her wig and on her bald head, she had written in Sharpie, Jamie Lee Curtis rocks. She went like this. Oh, she wow. pulled off her wig, <laughs> tipped her head forward. It said Jamie Lee Curtis rocks. Yeah. 
needless to say, I started to cry. And mm. uh, that night, I went to the charity event, and I went back to the hospital before, on my way to the event because she couldn't come because she was immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, can I have your wig for the night? And I walked into that event wearing her wig, and I stood up in front of those 5,000 people or whatever, mm -hmm. all of whom were there with the best intention to give right. money to Children's Hospital mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. And I stood up in front of those people and I said, my name is Jamie Lee Curtis. I'm wearing the wig of Katie Westbrook. She's 11. And mm. she's fighting for her life. And this is the way she fights for her life. She wears this wig so that everybody who sees her sees her. Right. She's saying, I am dying and I need you to help me. And we raised a fortune that night. Wow. And when she died, her mom gave me her wig. And any time I go and do children's mm -hmm. hospital events, I wear Katie's pink wig because I remind people this is what kids who are fighting cancer do when they lose their hair from chemotherapy. Here goes to... Jamie Lee Curtis! That is the moment Jamie Lee Curtis won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for her role in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, the first Academy Award of her decades-long career. Joe sat down with Curtis before the actor's strike began, and they spoke, among many other things, about her unexpected journey to winning that Oscar and the gift of being in movies, even the bad ones. Speaking about movies that aren't the greatest movies in the world, I love how I'm you... I'm in a bunch. I love how you embrace the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it reminds me of um, Jeff Daniels. He said, whenever I'm in a hospital... Yeah. If I ever go into a war zone, yeah. wherever I go, if I go see wounded vets, yeah. they all come up to me yeah. and they don't ask me about the movies that yeah. the critics love yeah. the most. Yeah. They said, tell me about Dumb and Dumber. And he goes, and I immediately can connect with him. Yep, sure. And he said, it's a great gift. And I was what with you, Owen you know, Wilson mm -hmm. at Disneyland for oh the Haunted Mansion press day. We are here talking about our new movie, Haunted Mansion for Disney, because we are big fans. Which is why Disney invited us to be honorary cast members for the day. And as we were leaving, I'm walking with Owen Wilson. Mm -hmm. He's been in, what, a billion movies. Love him. Such a great He's guy. He's amazing. The kids. Oh, <gasps> there's Lightning McQueen. <laughs> and he stopped. <laughs> And all of a sudden, yeah. Lightning McQueen yeah. answered their questions. Oh, my gosh. And you gosh. could see their faces. And I thought, there you go. It's so a, it is, by the a way, great example even the that. bad movies have fans. You have a book, a graphic novel. This after, like, The Bear and the winning Bear is an out. Academy Award. I, I mean, did win an Academy Award <laughs> this year. I did March, Let me ask by you the about way, that. March 12th. That movie is. It's just crazy. I mean, crazy script, yeah. crazy cinematography, yep. crazy editing, yep. crazy everything. And I will say, for like the first 30, 45 minutes, you sit there and go, where is this leading? And then it all opens up. Just a beautiful ending. But I bet, but I was wondering, when you won, I said, did you really think when she read that script, hey, I think I'm going to win an Academy Award from this one. Let me I mean, tell you this. Crazy. I, I like to remind people because the movie became something so big. And we all got very fancy. Mm -hmm. We were in fancy outfits. We were, you know what I mean? By mm -hmm. the end of the run, uh, uh, by the end of the release and the enormous success of the movie, mm -hmm. it, it took on a life of its own. It became so much bigger than any of us ever could have imagined in right. our lives. And we shot in 38 days in an office building in Simi Valley, California. And then COVID hit, and then it didn't get released for almost two years. The idea that anyone would have had a sense that what we were doing in this weird petri dish of creativity was going to yield not only, first and foremost, that was going to yield that movie. I didn't, I mm -hmm. had no idea. And then when I saw it, I saw it at the, I, the first time I saw the movie was the premiere 
of uh, the opening of South by Southwest oh, Film wow. Festival yeah. as the opening night movie. Mm -hmm. And that's where I went, oh. <laughs> oh that's what we did. But even yeah. then, the last thing in the world anyone was thinking mm -hmm. was that there would be golden season of, of shiny things was going to happen. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Even in the fall of last year, the end of the fall of last year, I got a phone call from my agent and Heidi mm -hmm. saying, so we were speaking to A24 about a campaign, and I said, a campaign for what? <laughs> for what? And they said, well, you know, they're, they're going to do an Oscar campaign. I was like, shut the f*** up. <laughs> like, shut up. Right. That's not going to happen. I get it that the movie is going to probably, you know, the movie itself. And, of course, um, Michelle, beautiful Michelle. Key was, of yeah. course, getting so much attention for, for his work. I was like, the editing, as you said, is extraordinary. Yeah. And I thought... Well, sure, but the last thing in the world I thought that it would be for me. I've been to the Oscars, I've presented at the Oscars, mm -hmm. and when we walked in, we were sitting in the front row at the Academy Awards, yeah. and I sat down, Michelle Yeoh mm -hmm. sat next to me, Ki Kwan, Stephanie Hsu, and I, I went up to each one of them. I'm going to literally do this, and you're going to freak out. Mm -hmm. I literally went up to each one of them in the front row and I went like this. I bent down at their seat and I went, Key, where are we? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I said, where are we? Mm -hmm. He said, at the Academy Awards. Yeah. He said, why? He said, because we're nominated <laughs> for what? Our movie, which is also mm -hmm. nominated. And where are we sitting? the front row, I said, at the Academy Awards, <laughs> okay? And then I moved down to Stephanie. Everyone. Same thing. Yeah. Michelle. Oh, my God. Because that isn't our lives. That isn't who we are. Right. We're not those people. Right, right. We don't sit in the front row at the Academy Awards. That's it was amazing. this little tiny movie that could and did and continue to movie. and yeah. one best picture at the Oscars. It was mind-blowing. Still hard to believe. It's unbelievable. Just took over the it's night. It's like Gone with the wind. Unbelievable <laughs> it, that it that is. happened. It is. That that happened to that group of people. Yeah. I mean, it was just yeah. extraordinary. And your, your character. Uh, Deirdre, Bo Beardra. Right. She's a tough IRS agent. But give anybody the opportunity you see the soft side she softens up at the end we are all human and we've all been through the ringer of life in whatever form and Deirdre Bo Beardra is a forgotten woman just like Evelyn was a forgotten woman Michelle Yeoh described her character as a woman you'd pass on the street and not even notice her have no acknowledgement of her Deirdre Bo Beardra it's one of those forgotten people, and they're all over the place. They're everywhere. And that they put Deirdre into that movie so that she then had that awakening right. with Evelyn was beautiful. But it, I loved representing those mm. forgotten people. Right. Um, and look at Donna Brazato as a woman who, right. on, in many ways... The is, same. Those, those two characters yeah. actually have a good bit in common. Yeah. Both those people are about as free as I've ever been. I want to ask you, I, I'm really curious, here you grow up in the shadow of Hollywood royalty, and yet all I hear about you from everybody, you went in to households in Iowa, usually when yeah. they would call people and say, With hey... Amy Klobuchar. Yeah. We would call people from, from Hollywood and say, hey, can you go camp? A lot of times... It was more trouble than it was worth. And, but isn't and that what we're supposed to do? That's what we're supposed to do, but I'm asking you. Isn't that why we're here How did you survive? Things? We hear the crazy stories. I was raised by my mom. My mom, yeah. I give her all the credit for the grounding of her. But beyond that, I've understood that from the beginning. What, is, what, are, what are politicians? What, are, what is the goal? Go to a house in Iowa. What are you saying? 
You're saying, what do you believe in? What matters to you? Well, that matters to her. Mm -hmm. And she will be your voice in that matter. What that issue, that that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to connect in anything, be it politics or pretending to be other people or charitable work or friendships or marriage or being a parent, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, 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 that to me is the real reason we're here. I want to ask you one more question. I saw an Instagram of you going in to the Disney store and you had the pride hat on mm -hmm. and you thanked Disney. That was especially personal for you. You said something about learning from Ruby. Yeah. And you talked about how you're learning every day. Every day. Every day. And the bottom line is it's about compassion. It's that line from a river runs through it. We can completely love those we don't completely understand. And I don't you wish that the political climate right now, especially on this issue, was so different than it is? How hurtful is it for you as a mom to well, see the hostility? They've demonized trans people. It's awful and it's terrifying. It's getting worse. Every day it's getting Every worse. Every day it's getting worse. At the bottom line, it's life is about love. Uh, being mm -hmm. a parent is about love. And I love Ruby. Love her. And I, people have said, you're so great to accept her. I was like, what are you talking about this is what parents do this is my daughter right this human being has come to me and said this is who I am and my job is to say welcome home mm -hmm. I will fight and defend her right to exist to anyone who claims that she doesn't and um, there are those people and it's, um, it's going to be a really challenging time, regardless of the political, I mean, there's a lot of political rhetoric, um, awful political rhetoric, uh, particularly coming from your home state. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. Um, as you know, my favorite uh, Twitter, Twitter is Twitter the uh, yeah. um, waking up in Don't Say Gay Florida is someone waking up going, gay! Um, and, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm trying to learn the most important thing is that I don't know everything. And I, I wake up every day sober saying I don't know everything. And I have gone to teachers. I've gone to people and said, please educate me. Help me learn what the issue is, why that's so important, and what the other opinion is so that I can hear both sides. Because if I only hear one side of an uh, argument or an idea, then I have no ability to think. And the whole idea here is we can think. We have minds to think. And as you said, like, how do you walk through this? Nobody, there's no handbook. There are people who will be helpful guides. But I get it wrong. I'm learning. I'm trying. I'm human. But at the bottom line is um, I'm a mom.